So hello everyone, my name is Piotr Hofer. I'm working at AntMicro. Uh, the topic of my talk today is automated simulation-based flow for low-cost FPGA-accelerated devices with Zephyr on Bio5 Fire. I will try to cover multiple different uh, topics with this talk. It will definitely not be as technical as the uh, previous one from Andy about the uh, uh, IPC or the, the previous one about Zbus, which was very interesting. Uh, it will be on a higher level of abstraction, uh, but I hope you will find it uh, informative as well. Uh, a few words about us uh, and Micro is an um, open source software driven company. Uh, we do a lot of hardware. We are uh, heavily involved with Risk Five. We were one of the founding members of, of the Risk Five Foundation. Uh, we are very heavily involved with Zephyr. Uh, we maintain risk five in uh, reporting Zephyr. Uh, we also do a lot of, uh, with uh, tooling around uh, simulation, uh, FPGAs, AC design, and that's part of the uh, Chips Alliance. Uh, why am I mentioning this? Because what I want to uh, highlight is that we work with the whole stack of technologies. That gives us, it puts us in a, mm, fairly comfortable position of uh, working with various different technologies um, that are not necessarily uh, in the typical tool set of uh, software developers. Uh, and that would be one of the aims of, of today's talk to uh, bring these uh, topics a little bit closer to, to people who are not necessarily very familiar with them. Uh, originally, the, the stock was uh, also supposed to be uh, led with, along with uh, Conor Paxton from Microchip. Uh, Microchip is uh, also one of the founding members of Risk Five. Uh, originally, back then it was Microsemi, and they were the, the largest semicon to uh, come into Risk Five. And well, it seems it uh, did very good. They have the Polarfire SOC. Uh, that's the first uh, SOC FPGA. Uh, on Risk Five, uh, I will talk a little bit more about this uh, particular SOC um, in a moment. Uh, but it's a beef, uh, pretty beefy uh, platform with an uh, integrated FPGA fabric. We have been working with them. Uh, I believe we started in, in 2017. Uh, we've been working on Reno simulation uh, for Polar Fire SOC for Risk Five. We have been integrating our our simulation framework with their. IDE called uh, Soft Console, and we have been working on cost simulation feature, uh, features, allowing you to uh, combine, uh, let's say, classical SOC simulation with uh, the FPGA part. I will cover all of these in a second. Uh, I mentioned Renode. Uh, Renode is our open source simulation framework. Uh, we support platforms from the whole range of, of uh, um, well, available hardware, uh, starting with small MCUs, ending with, up with, with uh, beefy multi-core uh, machines. Um, one of the key factors of, of Renode is that we aim to simulate whole systems and whole products. So you don't have to focus on simulating the, just the core, you focus on the whole uh, platform along with its peripherals, along with um, you know, sensors on, on a board or with some actuators that you might have. So the whole product can be simulated and you are able to run the same binary you would normally put on hardware. Uh, we support multiple uh, architectures, so of course RISC-V, and that would be uh, the main topic of, of um, today's conversation, uh, but also ARM Cortex-A, M, and R, uh, open power, uh, Spark for those of you who, who fly to space. Uh, Zephyr uh, Renote is, open, uh, is software agnostic, but I will show that uh, with uh, conjunction with Zephyr, it really gives us a really nice result. And while we couldn't run any type of software, Zephyr really is a very good match uh, for running along with uh, Renode. Tons of debug features, tracing, well, GDB debugging, of course, uh, also in multi-node uh, multi scenarios. 
uh, all of this is available uh, open source. Um, so going back to Polar Fire SOC, I'm sure you cannot read anything from this diagram, uh, but the idea is that uh, the, well, it's a really big platform. So uh, five cores, uh, one monitor core and four uh, application cores, uh, all of them 64-bit RISC-5s, uh, tons of different, different IP, uh, the different com uh, communication interfaces, uh, but also the FPGA part. And the FPGA part is something that, well, sometimes makes pe pe uh, people a little bit scary. They don't necessarily know what to do with that. Uh, but yeah, we'll try to, to uh, cover it in a second. Uh, originally, we're, when Microchip released uh, Polar Fire SOC to the public, and the, the original kit was called Icicle Kit, uh, and later on they, they released the Video Kit. Uh, so both of them are a little bit on the, the expensive side. So the Icicle is about $600, uh, Video Kit is uh, $2,000. So uh, if you're just an you know, amateur or, or uh, want to try it out, they're probably not the, the easiest um, pieces of hardware to obtain. Uh, but what is definitely worth, worth underlying is that uh, they were really uh, produced mass market. Uh, and while there, was, there were bots from, from Sci Five, like uh, uh, Hi Five Unleashed, and actually the, the Polar Fire SOC has the same CPU as Hi Five Unleashed, well, this is definitely uh, much easier to obtain. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the cost part is definitely uh, a big issue here. So, so enter Beagle 5 Fire, uh, which is definitely uh, more on the affordable side. I believe it's about $150. Uh, so you probably are all familiar with the, the uh, Beagle board uh, and all the boards they, they uh, produce. Uh, the form factor and the, the uh, connectors are uh, fairly known and, and uh, follow their uh, typical factors. Uh, there is a wide support for from the, the side of documentation. There's of course a big community ar around BeagleBoard. Uh, the design is open source uh, and it does have support in uh, Renode as well. Um, what does it mean that we have a support in, uh, in Renode? Uh, this is a short list of peripherals that we can uh, support running in Renode. So if your software uses, I won't read the list out loud because it doesn't make much sense, but uh, any of these, you can, you can easily run this in uh, Renode. Uh, PCIe is with a little asterisk because uh, I would call that a basic support. Uh, the idea of, of adding Polar Fire SOC to Renode uh, was interesting because it was there because before the, the silicon was on the market. So we were working with Microchip, adding these models, and as soon as they have announced the platform and released data about it, we were able to uh, allow people to, to, to simulate their software uh, in a virtual environment beginning the development of, uh, of their um, solutions early before they were able to, to actually get hold of the hardware. Because of course the SOC itself was released at some point, but before the, the uh, hardware platforms were available, well, some time had to pass. Uh, so yeah, we have quite a few uh, RISC-V platforms uh, available on the market. Uh, why is it special? As I mentioned, it's, it's five core, 64, uh, five 64-bit cores uh, with a fairly uh, standard uh, instruction set support. Uh, you get Ethernet, USB, uh, various different connectivity options, but I guess the FPGA fabric is, is the thing that, that makes it stand out and gives you the possibility of expanding the uh, capabilities to various different uh, areas. 
um, by the when, when we were submitting this talk, and Beagle Five Fire was definitely uh, one of the, the easiest uh, options to, to obtain affordable version uh, of Polarfly SOC. But of course, time is, time is moving forward. Uh, Microchip has announced its discovery kit, which will be in the uh, probably similar pr price range, uh, about $150. We have also made an uh, open source uh, system and module, which you can download all the, the details of uh, from our GitHub and look it up on our Open Hardware portal. Uh, Polarfy SOC comes with different FPGA sizes, so you have to take that into consideration, uh, depending on what your needs are and what are your plan, uh, planned applications. You might want to choose uh, different options. But of course, there are other platforms as well. If you type in Google uh, Polarfy SOC module, you will get tons of different results. Not all of them will be available for uh, for buying, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely getting some traction. So, but I guess that the, the bottom line is that that what Beagle Five Fire uh, caused is that this uh, work with Risk Five and FPGA solution is no longer uh, gated by by the high cost, high high price tag. Uh, but there is a discussion about the ease of use. Uh, not necessarily everyone is familiar with FPGA topics, uh, and there is some, some entry uh, barrier to that. Um, why should you even care? Uh, well, of course, the SOC itself is really powerful. You can do a lot with it. You don't have to... Um, care about the FPGA part. If you, you don't need to, you can just focus on the ASIC part and run your Linux or Zephyr or any other uh, piece of software you'd like to. But of course, uh, what the FPGA parts adds on top of that uh, is the ability to, to expand its capa uh, the capabilities of the base platform uh, with whatever you actually need. So typically, the uh, usages would span from machine learning accelerators, uh, some crypto mechanisms, some security mechanisms, uh, image or, or video processing. Any processing that can be easily parallelized is a good uh, match to, to put on FPGA. Uh, if you're interested in power efficiency and, and high speed processing of signals, uh, that's definitely something you can focus on. And of course, there will be dedicated solutions. Uh, you can buy a platform with specific DSPs that do whatever you need or specific ML accelerators. Uh, but if you need a custom solution, then FPGA is the way to go. Um, so, give me a sec. Um, when Microchip released, uh, first of all, Microchip contributed to Big 5 port to uh, Zephyr, uh, I believe that was the end of last year. Um, and when they released the, the, the Polarfy SOC in general, they have, cre uh, they have also uh, promoted their uh, IDE. Uh, it's called Soft Console. It's based on Eclipse. Uh, we have been working with them on integrating Renote into it, so it's quite easy to just you know press play and have it have your software running on hardware or in, or in Renote. Uh, in a simulated environment. Um, if you want to have uh, any FPGA-related payloads, of course, you have to program them first. Uh, the IDE does not uh, really help you with that. Microchip offers uh, other tools to do that. Uh, this is very convenient to use. You know, press play and everything works, uh, works fine. But this is probably not what Zephyr developers are used to. Uh, so, typically, your workflows would look a little bit different. Uh, so, yeah, the, the ID is there, but it's probably... The, and, yeah, I have to uh, underline that Microchip also has uh, released uh, debug configurations for, to run uh, Zephyr applications in Soft Console and debug, debug them easily. But still, this is, let's say, a fairly non-typical flow. Um, let me take a 
small detour here. Um, why am I even talking about Zephyr in this context? Of course, you can run any software on Beagle 5. Uh, you can uh, simulate any software in Zephyr. Why Zephyr is an important part of, of this talk. Um, in general, an Artos like Zephyr, that is uh, dubbed as uh, batteries included, uh, is aimed to enable all these features on different uh, hardware platforms in a fairly easy, configurable way. And I can definitely testify to, uh, to the fact that Zephyr does that uh, exceptionally well. So we have the modularity of the Artos. So we can turn features on and off. You can pick and choose whatever you need in your uh, application. You have discoverability of uh, features that are uh, available on your platform. Uh, for example, in the build system, it's very easy to verify if your platform does support specific features. Uh, with the hardware model version 2, which was uh, a recent very large change in the uh, way uh, platforms in Zephyr are described, this is even more prominent. Uh, Zephyr has device trees. Uh, by the exclamation mark, you may notice that I'm pretty excited about device trees. Uh, we use them in, in various different contexts, and I will tell you why in a second. Yeah, so, so how, how do we take advantage of this? So if you have listened to, to some of our talks in previous years, you might be familiar with, with some of the work that we that I will just mention right now. I will start with, with the Zephyr dashboard. This is our CI system where we take device trees from Zephyr, try to generate descriptions for Renode platforms, and run several, several uh, sample applications, run, ranging from Hello World, which is, well, ad admittedly fairly trivial, uh, through more complex like well, shell sample or MicroPython or uh, even some uh, TensorFlow like Micro or Canning applications where Canning is our uh, machine learning framework uh, that is integrated with Zephyr as well. Uh, and we get to run uh, 470 platforms as of this day, uh, which is about a little bit more than 80% of whatever is available in Zephyr. Uh, we present all these, these results in a nice you know, graphical way. You can inspect them, replay them easily. Uh, and we use that to, for two purposes. First, to improve Renode, because we want to support as many platforms as we can, but also to improve Zephyr. We have a CI that runs on, well, daily on, on, on uh, different versions of Zephyr. We are uh, very quick to detect any uh, regressions. Uh, also, we, when the, the move for to the, the hardware model V2 uh, took place, we also uh, were able to detect some regressions with that. We had improved the, the RISC-V port quite a bit with, with this work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, this is what we get from using device trees. We can analyze them, we can create simulations from them. And of course, th this is not specific to Zephyr. We can do that for you, but as well. Uh, or for other software payloads. Uh, what we need is a unified way to create software. So quite a, well, the best way would be a single command to, to build software for a target and a way to, to describe platforms in a machine readable way. So you boot Linux is also a good target, probably also other targets out there. Um, with all these CI systems that we're running, we get a lot of data about the systems. We are putting them together in, in Renotepedia, which is our uh, platform for, or, or a portal for presenting this information that we learn about different IP blocks, SOCs, boards, all levels across the, this whole landscape. Uh, we try to, to present them in, in a structured way, uh, creating a catalog, if you will, of, of uh, hardware components. Uh, very easy to navigate, uh, shows how to, to run things in, in Renode and, and uh, presents you with, with different software payloads if you, if you want to run them yourself. So getting back to, to this slide, um, I take device trees, I create some CIs with this, I get to create a lot of different uh, pieces of information, put them together. 
But this is, uh, well, slightly, uh, I would call it a passive approach to data that we have in, in Zephyr. Um, what we are working on now, and, and what I will present you live in a few seconds, is a more proactive approach. So given the fact that Zephyr platforms are based on device trees, that means we can leverage uh, this knowledge and leverage the, the knowledge about specific blocks and how they are connected together, how to create new device trees and create new platforms that are not yet available in Zephyr fairly easily. And Visual System Designer is our tool that allows you to create platform description in a well, fairly formalized way based on building blocks that we uh, have gathered from or created from our, uh, well, few different sources like the dashboards that I showed you or in Wikipedia, uh, but also our uh, hardware uh, work with open source hardware, uh, hardware designs uh, where we have a large library of components that we can put together to create fairly complex and complete descriptions of systems. And uh, going back to Beagle, Five Fire, and Polar Fire SOC. As I mentioned, uh, the, the topic of FPGAs is not always familiar to, to also, uh, software developers. And it, there is always some barrier to, of, of entry to, to, to get started with um, FPGA pay payloads. And of course, there are different ways to, to uh, interact with uh, IP that is loaded on um, FPGA, uh, but we will focus on, on one of them in a second. Uh, there is a big trend, and of course, our work in, in Chips uh, Alliance is also uh, following this or, or even even paving the way for this, uh, this trend to create more and more open source IP uh, available for the users out there. So this is not something that you can, if you want to have a specific peripheral block modeled in your FPGA, you don't have to go to your vendor, buy it for a million of dollars and, and then try to, to, to integrate in your FPGA system. You can use blocks that are open source publicly available. When you create a FPGA IP, you write your code in uh, a hardware description language, Verilog or VHDL or Chisel or, uh, well, there are many right now. Uh, and when you have this description, you can compile it with Verlater as one of the available tools. It's a popular simulation tool for uh, Verilog. And you can customize it with Renode. So we create a simulation where part of, it, of the system is described in Renode, part of it is described in RTL directly. Uh, so it's generally not very difficult, but, but if you would like to, to hide this complexity and, and make it work with your software fairly easy, we can try to, to, to use our VSD system designer to, to, to make it a little bit easier. And I will push my luck now and try to do a live demo. Uh, nothing can go wrong, obviously. That's how live demos work. Um, I will use a self-hosted version. We are, uh, if you have seen the uh, presentation from Michael uh, last hour at the, the fifth floor, you might have seen our, our uh, craft portal that will uh, kind of expose it in a uh, well, online way. Let me start. Uh, self-hosted version first. So this is the Visual System Designer. Uh, what you see uh, in the middle is, well, of course, our workspace. And on the left, there is a large library of components. Of course, I will not create a Beagle 5 uh, fire description from scratch because that would take me, well, some time. Uh, but I will have it prepared. So yeah, this is a graph that describes the platform. As you can see all the details in the screen, and oh, you probably can't see that, but I have a zoom wheel here, right? Uh, zoom is so cool. 
so this is the Polar Fire SOC uh, SOC, and it's connected to multiple various different devices. So you have something connected to I2C, something connected to GPIOs. Here you have M2 connector connected somehow. And you know, a lot of data. A micro SD connector, uh, here is Ethernet, etc., etc. You have some buttons, you have some LEDs. The whole system is described here. What can we do with this? Each of these blocks, well, not each, each, because some of them are not really important from the perspective of your software. But the ones that are, uh, are uh, have associated uh, device tree entries. So we know how to de uh, describe them in device tree. So what I, I can do right now, I can press play. And yeah, now this is the part that, that should not break. Let's hope. Yeah, live demos. Uh, okay, yeah, it works. Ah. So uh, what what happened just now? We took this this diagram. We put it. Uh, we we put some warning for for blocks that are not supported in the in this flow. Of course, we can we can describe more than we can simulate, uh, which is fine. We are building a device tree out of it. We are building Zephyr. If you have ever built Zephyr, you're pretty familiar with these types of logs. And we are trying to, to run it in, in simulation. And here I have a UR0 and, well, probably something that you're familiar with. Help. Yay. Uh, and you have a, well, typical shell console. Uh, no FPGA included right now. I will close the simulation. Uh, what we have added in this flow is a little bit of a trick. Uh, if you scroll down, you see this FPGA uh, node. This is supposed to be a connector for the uh, memory mapped devices that you put on FPGA. Uh, you will notice that some of the things I will do right now are a little bit simplifications of what's happening in, in real life, but I will try to explain myself. So I'm looking for a specific UART block, but this could be any FPGA IP that I would like to, to simulate. Uh, I'm using a specific block named like that just to get some meta information displayed. Uh, so we have some information about this block. It's, it will be labeled as UART 8. It has some address pre-configured. I can use any other address, but I, yeah, for the, <laughs> For, for the, the demo, I probably wouldn't have remembered this specific address uh, that we verified not to collide with anything else. Uh, I also add a specific interrupt number because it will be connected to the, the interrupt controller. Uh, I'll put it on the other side. And yeah, I can connect it to the FPGA connector as well. What if I try to connect it to something else? Well, I can because the system is smart enough to know that it's not a GPIO, it's a memory map peripheral, so I have to connect it to this connector, if I manage to do that with my shaking hands. Yeah. All right. Uh, of course, you know, this is a block. When we are talking about IP, there is some RTL. I was telling you that we are compiling something with her later, and I'm definitely not lying here. Uh, we have, uh, I, well, admittedly, I have it pre-compiled, um, but we have, we have it on our uh, repositories, if you'd like to re uh, reproduce this, this flow, it's, it's fairly easy. I have compiled the, the related block uh, for this very purpose. And I have printed out the path here so it doesn't elude me. Okay, so I have address pre-configured and interrupt number pre-configured just for the sake of the demonstration. I use the, the sum uh, compiled uh, RTL block, and I can use some uh, settings that are typically reflected by device trees. Let's make it the default console and the shell UART. Yeah, let's press play. Uh, please note that this is UART 8, and well, previously we've been putting out things on UART 0. So this board does not exist in, uh, in Zephyr at all. Uh, 
there is no board with, with light keyboard connected to, to at this specific address. But apparently we're already done, and so the Zephyr was rebuilt, and I have yet another UART that's actually using this very related block. You will see it's very related because it's slightly slower to simulate. So yeah, you see that the, the output is, well, probably not, not very visibly, but it works slightly slower. Uh, to show that it's not like a, a pre-prepared uh, a demo, I can I can even try to, for example, split the uh, UARs between these two. So between uh, the default UR0 and UR8. So let me let me disable shell UART. Pre press play again. Yeah, Zephyr is rebuilding in the back. And you see that, yeah, here I get the prompt, the, the welcome message. And on UR0, I have the uh, shell prompt because, well, we return to the, back to the default. And to even more highlight that it's actually uh, working with the whole build system, let me go to, um, to this directory and, sh and show you what does it mean to have a board in Zephyr. Actually, not that much. So this is the data that we generate from, uh, from the design itself. We have a dev config, device tree, uh, kconfig entry, board YAML, and this is only for the purpose of, of using the, the related block, and uh, not uh, that important. Let me go to the DTS. Uh, you will see that this is a fairly regular DTS with, you know, uh, cores, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's not maybe as pretty as the ones that are hosted by Zephyr because it's auto-generated. So you'll see, for example, that when you go a little bit down, you will see some blocks that could be in line with the others. Uh, but we are, uh, of course, uh, trying to, to, to make them uh, on the fly. Uh, these are blocks that were uh, created from, from the graph itself. Uh, so some LED. Uh, and the the UART itself. So you have the the uh, UART. It's labeled as UART8. It's a specific address uh, with interrupt connected to plic, interrupt number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is the the entry specific for this uh, particular block. And we have the the chosen entries as selected by uh, this graph. It actually matches. Yeah, good. I didn't check that before, but it does. Uh, kconfig and devconfig, they are not really that important. Uh, but this is ev actually everything what you need to get a board in, uh, in Zephyr, right? So it's fairly, fairly trivial. Uh, yeah, and the, the YAML itself, that was probably the last thing I wanted to show, it indicates what, what kind of SOC is there, name of the board, uh, as specified on this, uh, in, in the graph itself, in, in the graph file that I loaded. Uh, so we have full control over, uh, over what's going on here. Uh, everything is created from, uh, from scratch. So let me get back to the presentation and up, reiterate over what have you seen here. We have a powerful SOC. Uh, we have a graph that describes the whole board. Uh, we have the uh, block that was not previously there, but we have added it. Uh, so from the software perspective, it doesn't really get any easier. Does it mean that you can take this binary load on your uh, BBL5 uh, platform and it will run? Well, no, because you have to have the FPGA programmed as well. That's another set of tools. We're not covering that part yet, but of course, uh, here we are focusing on, on the software part. Uh, the software has been built specifically for this, this particular platform, so, so you can see that I have been selecting and deselecting uh, the, the, some of the DTS options to redirect the UART output one way or the other. Uh, it's Nothing is here is vendor specific. It's 
secure Zephyr data. And the fact that the data is there and it's uh, carefully maintained by a bunch of people makes it, uh, well, us included, makes it very easy to, to, to follow this, this kind of flow. All of the data, including all of the blocks and, and that we put together and that describe the whole board is open source. The whole processing part is also open source. Uh, and yeah, we're, it's very easy to reproduce this locally and expand it to, to support more, uh, more scenarios as well. Uh, if you want, you can, you can go to our GitHub, find relevant repos or ask me for them and, and uh, you will be able to contribute with your own data, uh, making our nodes more specific or adding new uh, hardware components, whatever you please. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, Michael's talk last hour uh, probably covered the first point and that we would like to expose a dedicated portal to, uh, to users and have more people involved. Uh, we would like to enable more software scenarios. Of course, this was Shell. Michael was showing a scenario with, with some sensors, uh, temperature sensors, readouts, and blinking LEDs. Uh, of course, this is fun, but <laughs> that doesn't uh, complete the whole, um, let's say, area of, of possible, uh, possible options here. Uh, ID integration is something that we'll be also working on. We haven't seen the, the uh, well, this is web-based, so all modern IDs are kind of also web-based. Integration is definitely uh, in scope. Uh, vendor independence, well, it's already there actually, right? So, so we are relying on, on data from, from Zephyr and we definitely intend to keep that. So, so we are not trying to, to focus on specific platforms. We try to expand our, uh, our interest to, to new ones and support as much as we can. This was a level of a board. So we had an SOC, we've connected different, uh, different blocks uh, around it, but we want to work on different levels of abstractions. So you should be able to design your SOC in this kind of system. You should be able to design your board as well, but also a device. So connect multiple hardware platforms, connect them over certain uh, interfaces, and then when running this kind of simulation, inspect the status of these interfaces, inspect the communication, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, if you're interested, reach out to us uh, or talk to me, or if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. Thank you very much. I have a microphone here, oh. so I should probably pass it to you. Yeah, so uh, that was a great demo. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I was just wondering, um, be, so by default, it executes on Renote when you press play. Yep. Um, how about, the, do, you, do you also foresee doing the same but flashing onto real hardware Have you when you press play, or is that not in the, in the works? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I, I will try to run another demo. That will show you that, that running in Reno is much funnier. But uh, no, I, actually, it's, it's not really a, a big issue uh, to, to uh, connect it to, to real hardware, right? So, so I would say that a lot of work is about exposing data uh, from Reno and, and showing them here. So I was only showing the UART, but we can you know, blink LEDs or we can uh, read temperature readouts from, uh, from, from nodes that are described on the graph. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Probably uh, doing the, the hardware part would be the easy thing here. So I, I don't well, see any the, issues. You, you, you mentioned yourself the programming of the FPGA, right? That would have yeah. to actually physically happen when you press play, correct? Uh, yeah, and well, there will be definitely more, uh, uh, more to, the, uh, to, to, to that. I will just try to actually load the second demo. Oh, oh, do I have it? Let's hope it works. Okay, so this is a fairly simpler demo where we have an STM and uh, LEDs and, and it's not this demo. All right, so I will show you uh, afterwards. So I, I, I don't have a full setup, sorry. Uh, I might try to run it very quick. Uh, sorry, I, I, I shouldn't. I should say no, it's, it can't be done right now, but 
I'm, I'm, I'm too deep right now. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Pressure's on. Yeah. I'm very fast. I'm very fast. Yeah, I got this. I so got this. Um, I will restart this one. Uh, I have it, I have it. It's almost there. Wow. Yeah, so this is a very similar, it, it's, yeah, we, we are working on multiple branches right now. Oh, okay. It's not this one. Maybe we ah! should do the demo later. I will try to run it anyway, we'll oh. see what happens. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the idea is that uh, we have access to, to all of these, these blocks and we can read out, read out the, the specific details. Yeah, so we can see that LEDs are blinking uh, on this. This With the hardware, this will be more difficult, right? We have some temperature sensors, which I can change temperature, and you can see that in the, the Zephyr logs because they are being read out. Uh, but yeah, uh, the FPGA programming part is kind of vendor-specific, right? So, so there, is, there will be a lot of vendor-specific uh, bits on, on that layer. So I try to focus on what is vendor, in, uh, on what is vendor independent, which is software in that case. My question was sure. uh, related to FPGA. So, I mean, there is, as you mentioned, there is definitely a niche of people who are doing FPGA development simultaneously with Zephyr development, mm -hmm. uh, co-design, if you will. Um, and for the Zephyr FPGA uh, area, I think it'd be really useful to actually integrate some of the open source synthesis tools. Oh, yeah. So that we could drop our RTL and our driver in the same directory and just do, like, co-design and co-simulation, that sort of thing. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, we uh, Yeah, please, please. I, I remember ta talking to Connor about this a couple of years ago mm -hmm. at uh, ZDS. Actually, was it? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Or no, it was a RISC-V summit, my mistake. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if, there have any, if there have been any discussions about uh, microchips supporting the open uh, synthesis tool. Yeah, I guess we, we're not necessarily uh, there yet. Uh, this is still on the branch. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that, that in general, uh, with the advent of open source synthesis tools, uh, which we are working on a lot, uh, integrating these flows together is definitely closer than it used to be before. Uh, we're probably have to do some some homeworks to, together fully, but yeah. My next question, I just wanted to see what uh, Jason Kredner, Kredner uh, his uh, thoughts were, uh, founder of BeagleBoard. Sure. Yeah, I would, I would love to integrate with the CI flow that we have, right? So I don't know if we can start with like, we, we, we publish a gateway in our CI so that people don't have to install Libero in order to build new gateware. So it'd be nice to kind of close that loop entirely, right? Go into simulation so you can validate your Verilog um, with running drivers and everything in the system and then go back into do the, the generation of the the bitstream, right? And then we have Linux command line tools for reprogramming the bitstream with that. Um, and it'd be interesting to introduce bitstream reprogramming with Zephyr as well, right? So that it's not just in from, from Linux. But my question, um, so yeah, absolutely love to work on integrating this into our CI flow. But my question is, is do you do the same thing with, with Linux, right? Because you're running a, a, a kernel, I mean, a, um, an emulation of the, the CPU core, um, can we do the same thing, generate the device trees and, and, and run this with um, device tree overlays and, and Linux kernel? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, so we are actually working on, on running uh, Ubuntu on, on Build 5 Fire right now uh, in simulation. We are, I would say, almost there. Some bits missing, but, but we kind of get to user space and we need to get system D to finish its uh, startup. Uh, but, but in a more general sense, uh, Zephyr has one big advantage. Uh, it's newer, so the device trees are of better quality. Uh, and yeah, really. Uh, so, 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 uh, and uh, I don't have like a, a very strict data on, uh, on Linux itself, but we are working with Uboot, which has very similar device trees. And of course it's aimed to, to, to boot Linux afterwards. Uh, and well, you find uh, device trees that have no CPU, for example, because well, no one really cared about describing them in, in, uh, in a device tree. And when we are trying to build a system out of it, we kind of need to know this kind of details. Uh, so uh, with a proper description, with 
good mappings from, from the compact strings to, to the drivers and our models, this is also definitely possible. Zephyr is just, you know, a, small tar a smaller target. So I think it's a, a fairly easier first step. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter.